Hi, and thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Hi, thanks for joining us this evening. For the next two Wednesday nights, we're going to be looking at the glory of Christmas. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your wonder, for your glory, for the wondrous things we see in your word. May you encourage our hearts. Help us to understand even more clearly the joy of Christmas as we look into your holy word and seek to understand your wondrous glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The story unfolds before us in Luke chapter 2. The scripture says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Now that's one of the key focus points of our lesson tonight, the glory of the Lord. The scripture says when this glory appeared to them, they were greatly afraid. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Before, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, this particular glory that appeared, we often refer that as the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory cloud. <clears throat> and so we look at this word, Shekinah, we want to understand it. And it was an unexpected sight. The shepherds were not expecting to see this event. It had not been seen in several hundred years. The scripture tells us here, though, a number of things about the Shekinah. First of all, let's look. What is the Shekinah? Well, two significant things. Number one, it is the visible glory of God. Uh, when you see the glory of God, the glory of God, it is generally a reference to this particular element, the Shekinah glory of God. It is a white, shining light of intolerable brightness. We're going to look at it <clears throat> as we go through the scriptures and understand a little bit more about this Shekinah, the glory of God. Let's look at the Shekinah as it is revealed in God's Word. We're going to do it kind of chronologically, starting at the very beginning, the light of creation. One of the cool things about creation is the Bible tells us that God created light before He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And that is extremely interesting. And so we look at it and understand that this special light that God created was His glory, the light of creation. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, the scripture says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Wondrous element of creation. The entire creation process was illuminated by the very glory and the light of God. Let's look at another example, the light of the burning bush. We saw this in the scriptures in the Old Testament 
when Moses, as a shepherd, was looking up to the hills and he saw a bush that appeared to be burning, but it wasn't being consumed. And most theologians believe this was a reference to the very glory of God. And the reason they do is because of this passage of Scripture. <clears throat> the Lord saw Moses coming to look at the bush, and the Lord called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Then God said, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. The very presence of God, the glory of God was revealed in that particular instance. He said, I am the God of your ancestors. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. He understood the magnificence of this glory in which he was standing. And so we see it's the light of creation, the light of the burning bush, but it is also the light of the Exodus. When the nation of Israel was leaving and going out from, from Egypt, going toward the promised land, they had a light that they followed for the entire journey. It was the light of the Exodus. The Bible says the Lord guided them by a pillar of cloud during the daytime and by a pillar of fire at night so that they could travel either by day or night and the cloud and fire were never out of their sight. This was always referred to as the Shekinah, the glory of God. And when they stopped, it rested right over where the Ark of the Covenant would be and that's where they would put it. And so the light of the Exodus <clears throat> Later, when they entered into the promised land, and even when they were traveling as they had uh, built this great tabernacle that God had given them, this became the light of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was always placed in the center of the nation of Israel, and they would, they would put themselves in tribes on each of the four sides of them. There were 12 tribes, and they would divide themselves up so that they were on all four sides of the tabernacle would be in the middle. And in the middle of that, right over the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was that I mentioned earlier, this Shekinah glory would light up the tabernacle. Everyone knew where the tabernacle was because it was so easy to see. Later, that same Shekinah glory would rest over the temple in Jerusalem. But here we see the light of the tabernacle. The Bible says in Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the what glory of the Lord filled it. Moses was not able to enter because the cloud was standing there, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. So we have the Shekinah. It's the glory of God. It's the, a light of intolerable brightness. We see it's the light of creation, the light of the burning bush, the light of Exodus, the light of the tabernacle and the temple. But sadly, at one point in time, the Shekinah was removed from the temple. The scripture tells us the story of how the nation of Israel and the priests particularly had allowed foreign deities to enter into their worship system, even so much as putting these false elements of worship, these idols, in the very temple courtyards that people would come and they could choose to worship Jehovah God or they could worship one of these other deities. And God said, my glory cannot remain here among these people. And so the scripture tells us in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. And while I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as they went, the wheels went with them and they stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the Lord of Israel was above them. The scripture goes on to relate the story of how the Shekinah glory traveled out over that eastern gate and then up the side of the mount that was there where the, um, where the uh, gardens were, where it would slip up over the top of the hill, not to be seen. Again, 
by those people during that time period. And we see that the Bible tells us that the glory of the Lord departed from Jerusalem. Now, there's a word for that. It's the word Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory of the Lord has departed. It's no longer here. And so that was when the Shekinah was removed. But praise be to God, the Shekinah returned. The Bible tells us on that night when those shepherds were there on that hillside outside of Bethlehem, the night that Jesus was born, behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Can you imagine this thing hadn't been seen in centuries and suddenly here's this Shekinah glory cloud, this great light. It was right there, right there in that field where those shepherds were. What a wondrous sight. And the Shekinah returned. Now, the odd thing is, is that God chose not to reveal uh, this birth to kings and not to reveal it to the priests. He chose to reveal it to shepherds. And they were quite an unlikely audience. So let's take just a minute and look at the shepherds. When we look at the status of the shepherds in Israel, it's important that we understand how they were viewed. Now, this is quite unfortunate, what I'm going to tell you. Uh, the Scripture and the Talmud, the historical documents that we have, relate that shepherds did not have a very high status. According to the Talmud, it is written that the shepherds were not allowed to be witnesses in court. They were deemed to be unreliable. And so they could never be a witness in court. You say, who's your witness? Well, my witness is a shepherd. Uh, that's not acceptable. We can't accept the witness of a shepherd. It's interesting that God chose to illuminate and to reveal himself to shepherds who could never be considered a reliable witness for the things that were beginning to unfold. Very interesting. In the Ovda Zara of the Talmud, the scripture, the, the document teaches us that no help was to be offered to heathens or shepherds. In other words, when shepherds were in a situation and they needed uh, benevolent help that was offered to all of the people of Israel, when they were hungry or when they were hurting or when they had a need, they could often come there and beg for alms or they could receive a gift from the priest that they might not starve to death, that they would have provision. No shepherds, they get nothing. Don't bother to even try to help shepherds. Can you see how prejudicial this is? And so shepherds were not allowed to be witnesses. They were not allowed to receive any benevolent help whatsoever. And the, script, the, the documentation that we have from that area tells us that shepherds were despised by most because they were not allowed to attend temple services to observe the rituals and cleansing and ceremonial law. They were not allowed to do that. Um, when we look at them, uh, it goes on to tell us that their occupation kept them from their religion. Even though they provided the lambs for sacrifice, <clears throat> the only way they could enter the temple was through the sheep gate, which was an underground area for holding the sheep for sacrifices. They were never allowed to be up in the temple, never allowed to bring their own lamb as a sacrifice for their sins. Uh, they were not allowed in the temple. And it's a very unfortunate thing that their status was so low. And so when we look in to the Word of God and we see that He chose to reveal Himself to shepherds, they were quite, uh, you know, an unlikely audience because of their status. But we have to ask, why did God reveal Jesus to the shepherds? When you understand a little bit more about their status, they can't be used as a reliable witness, a legal witness. No help was ever offered to them, no benevolence or care. And they were not even allowed into the temple. They were not even allowed to worship and celebrate with the rest of all Israel who would go to Jerusalem to the temple. So why did God reveal Jesus to the shepherds? Well, I think, first of all, because Jesus is our shepherd uh, John 10, verses 14, 15, Jesus said, 
I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. You look at Jesus and he referred to himself as a shepherd and we as sheep. <clears throat> and here the religious leaders of that day had no respect, no care, concern, no love for shepherding at all even though the Old Testament reveals that the priests were the shepherds of God's people. They were like people that had no shepherd, the Old Testament says, because they did not respect or understand the nature of their responsibilities. But Jesus is our shepherd, and that's important for us to understand that I believe that Jesus revealed himself to shepherds because he is the great shepherd, the good shepherd. I think, secondly, because Jesus cares for people regardless of status, station, or stuff. And all God's people said, Amen. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been. Jesus cares about people. He cares about you, and He cares about me. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, uh, and at this point in time, Peter had had a little bit of a prejudicial view toward people who were not Jewish. But God revealed to him that he was the God of everyone, regardless of status, station, or stuff. He said this to them, to Peter, you will care and carry the gospel to these people. <clears throat> and after God had revealed himself in that way, Peter opened his mouth and said, most certainly and thoroughly, I now perceive and understand that God shows no partiality and is no respecter of persons. In other words, everybody's on the same level playing field when it comes to God. You say, wait a minute, I've been a believer and a Christian for all these years, and you're telling me this guy who's a drunkard, who beats his wife, who is a horrible person in our community and doesn't contribute, that he's the same in God's eyes as I am? And I'm telling you, yes, he is. God loves him just as much as he loves you. And that... When you grasp that in your heart and in your mind, it gives you a whole new perspective of the lost. Because you see, one time before you accepted Jesus Christ, you were just like them. And God loved you and brought you into his fold. Uh, someone came to me a few years back and they felt like they were unworthy to come to church. And I said, well, I want you to come. And he said, why would you want me to come? And I said, because... If you're good enough for Jesus, you're good enough for me. And that's important for us to bear in mind. Uh, Jesus cares for people regardless of their life, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they own. And so we understand that God revealed Jesus to shepherds because he is our shepherd and because he regards us all the same. He loves us all the same. And I think there's a third reason. I think it's because Jesus is the Lamb of God. You know, Jesus had met John at the River Jordan, and he had asked John to baptize him. Of course, John did. Well, Jesus left that day, but he came back the next day. And when he came back the next day, and that's what the Scripture says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These shepherds took these lambs to Jerusalem, brought them into the temple underneath through the sheep gate, and then those same lambs were taken up and sacrificed for the sins of God's people. Every day they had these sacrifices. And so we look at Jesus. He is the one who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came. We've looked at the Shekinah, we've looked at the shepherds, and now I'm going to give you a new name, a new title for Jesus, for the promised one. It is Shiloh. The word Shiloh means he who it is. It's a very obscure term. It's only used of this Messianic title one time in the scriptures. We look at Shiloh and we want to seek to understand Shiloh, uh, first of all, Shiloh is a powerful king. The Bible tells us in Genesis 49 and verse 10 
This scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, obviously, this is a reference to the second <coughs> coming of Christ, but nonetheless, it is a title, a title until Shiloh comes. Uh, one of the translations that I was looking at, because this is such an obscure word, <clears throat> it is also the name of a town or a series of towns that were during the biblical times during the Old Testament. But uh, we look at Shiloh and it is a word that, that refers to uh, kindness, gentleness. And so we see that Shiloh is coming. He who it is, the one who is promised, and he is the one who will come. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So Jesus is called a powerful king. He will be a great king. But he's also the promised savior. You see, you can't have the second coming of Christ without the first coming. And the first coming, he came as our savior. The second coming, he will come as our Lord and king. But here we see as a promised savior, that same passage we looked at earlier in Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. By the way, that word for Savior, Yeshua, it's a direct reference to the name of Jesus. Jesus means Savior, Yeshua. He is our Savior, and He is Christ the Lord. And so we understand Shiloh, but let's look at Shiloh's humble birth. The Bible tells us this great and powerful king, this promised savior, when he came into the world in Luke chapter 2 and verse 12, uh, the angel told the shepherds, this will be the sign to you. This is the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Very important that we understand the humbleness of the birth of Christ. That, too, adds to the element of revealing this to shepherds because of the humble nature in which they were. <coughs> they had no status. They had no real sense of wealth. They had no respect in the community. But yet God chose to reveal himself to the lowest of people in a class. And he said, I am going to reveal Shiloh to you. I'm going to reveal this wonderful, wonderful gift a powerful king one day, and a promised savior for today. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. And the humility of his birth is demonstrated in Luke chapter 2. Now, how do you and I respond to his glory? I think the shepherds give us a clear example of how you and I need to respond to the glory of God. First of all, we accept it. Do you know it's interesting and in verse 15 of Luke chapter 2, the scripture says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. They did not question it. They didn't debate it and say, Well, this was some fancy light show, you know, whatever it was. And they didn't discard it. They accepted it for what it was. And they accepted it as being from the Lord. It says, let us go and see what the Lord has made known to us. And so they, they accepted it. And you and I need to be the same way. We need to just accept the glory of Christ, the glory of our Lord, and believe in Him. The second thing they did was they shared it. And we need to share it too, the same way. When we have received and accepted Jesus Christ and believed in Him as our Savior, the Savior of all the world, we share it with others. The Bible says in chapter 2 and verse 16, 17, they ran to the village, they found their way to Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger, and the shepherds told everyone what has happened and the, what the angel had said to them about this child. And uh, so we see them. They shared it. They told everyone they met. They just went everywhere and started telling people about this great event. And so we look and see 
that we need to be the same way. Once we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we need to share Him with others. We need to be like these shepherds and tell everyone what had happened. And then finally, we celebrate it, just as the shepherds did. The scripture says the sheep herders returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. Dear friend, you and I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility just like those shepherds. First, to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Second, to share it. You know, we have our... Um, special candlelight Christmas service coming up this Friday at 6.30 at the church. And if you're close enough that you can come, I encourage you to come. But if you you have friends who you know need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you want to share it with them, invite them to come with you. Bring them to this service that they might hear and know and understand And it will be you that is sharing the gospel with them because you invited them to come. And you will experience the joy and the encouragement of those who hear and believe and accept Him as Lord and Savior. And when you do that, when we all come together on Friday night, celebrate. It's going to be a celebration of the birth of our King, the birth of our great Savior, the birth of Shiloh. And I pray the glory of the Lord will be with us. I thank you so much for listening tonight. I pray that the Lord will bless you and encourage you. But, dear friend, if you don't know for certain if you died that you go to heaven, but you want to know, the Scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the wonder of it. I thank you for the joy of it. And I pray that you would encourage every heart of every believer this hour. But Lord, there may be those that are listening and they don't know for certain if they died, they go to heaven, but they want to know. And dear friend, if that's you, God is listening. Would you just bow your head with me and pray a prayer, a sincere prayer to him and just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of all my sins. I want to go to heaven one day when I die. And so I'm going to place my trust in you, believing that you died on the cross for me and shed your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin. I believe that when you drew your last breath, they took you down from that cross and laid you in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, you gloriously and wondrously rose from the dead. What power you have, Lord Jesus. I know it's the power to save me. So will you come into my heart and my life and be my Savior to forgive me of all my sins and wash me white as snow? Will you be my Lord to lead me, to help me make the right decisions in life? And will you be my friend to walk with me no matter what I must face in this life and one day walk the streets of glory with you? Dear friend, if you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it with all of your heart, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let somebody know. Let a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a family member know that today you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't have anyone you can tell, drop me a note there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. Hey, I hope I see many of you on Friday night at our Christmas Eve candlelight service. It's a beautiful, beautiful service, and I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift His countenance upon you to watch you, no matter where you go. And until we come together the next time, go in peace, love, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. As always, my friends, keep looking up.